Breaking news! Human adult discovers that some providers charge more for dermal fillers than others. Why? But first, for the more astute amongst you, you'll notice there are some changes around here. I am of course referring to my haircut. Oh and the fact that I am five months pregnant as well, so yay! down to the meat which is what where's the meat where's the meat there it is according to the website a edit who've done the research so i don't have to in 2019 the average cost of a juvederm injection was 652 dollars which today is 489 pounds these statistics are according to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Juvederm in the US is priced anywhere between $250 to $4,500. But what's the reason for this discrepancy? Side note, I will be referring mainly to dollars in this video because most of our audience are from the lovely US. Hello. Would you like a cup of tea? Juvederm is of course a type of hyaluronic acid dermal filler and there are tons of different ones out there which is something I will come on to in a moment. But what were the factors involved in the level of pricing? The first was the actual provider providing the injection and the second was the location of the facility. The other thing to note would also be the type of procedure i.e. which area of the face was being injected. If you look at this average juvederm cost by treatment area picture, really the pricing is quite broad. People tend to be charging more for the under eye area and the cheek than they do for other areas. I don't know who is charging $4,500 for the under eye area, but um, I am available uh, for work should you be needing someone else. Let me know in the comments if you know who it is. Uh, FYI, I'm not available, I'm actually very busy. You can see on this map the average cost of filler according to each individual state. With my very limited knowledge of American geography, I can't tell you much about that map. What I can tell you is you're probably fine if you live in the middle, unless you need an abortion. And then you're in trouble. Hopefully they've also compiled a list of countries with the average cost of filler there. As you know, I am in the UK and I can tell you that 150 to 750 dollars is probably not that correct. I do know of someone in Central who works from Harrods who charges a thousand pounds per syringe, which is 1,331 dollars per syringe. That's probably the most expensive you're gonna find it for here. As I said, I'd be very intrigued to know who's charging $4,500 for under eye filler. You might as well have surgery for that money. If you want a bargain, then maybe you have to go to Columbia, but whatever you do, if someone asks you to bring something back on the plane for them, don't do that. Of course, it makes sense that a country with a low cost of living is gonna have cheaper cosmetic procedures. What we have here is the cost of living index by country 2021. If you look at the rankings, you'll see that the top 10 most expensive countries to live in are Bermuda, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Barbados, who recently made the interesting decision to remove Queen Elizabeth as the head of state. And her place has been taken, I understand, by Rihanna. Jersey. Protective side and Bergerac. I used to love Bergerac when I was a kid. Obviously that's Jersey the country, not the state. Denmark, Luxembourg, Israel and the Bahamas. You'll notice that there are quite a few tax havens amongst that list. If we take a look on the list, we can see that the UK comes in at number 27 and the USA at 28. Australia, much higher at 14. The lucky 5% of our audience in Germany, you guys are at number 32. Congratulations. Let's drill down into those country figures a little bit more. So say the average price of filler in America is $600 to $1,000 and the average monthly net salary after tax, $3,575. That equates to 4.4 mils per month that you could buy with your hard earned cash, should you wish. Mexico, cost of filler, $200 to $500. 550 is the average monthly wage after tax. Sadly, you can only afford a measly 1.5 mils per month. 
150 to 750 dollars per mil not sure about that but anyway uh 2675 pounds sorry dollars you know what i mean is the average monthly wage you can afford a whopping 5.9 mils Australia, 400 to 850 dollars per syringe, an amazing 3,725 dollars average monthly wage, six mils per month. Well done, Bonza. Japan, 400 to 850 dollars per syringe, average monthly wage, 2,800 dollars. You can afford 4.5 syringes per month. Arigato gozaimasu. By the way. The baby is half Japanese, not my half. What are you actually paying for when you buy that syringe? Well, first of all, you have the obvious things like the time of the provider, but then you also have other things like the consumables involved, the cost of the facility, the cost of other administrative staff, things like insurance, PR, maintaining a YouTube channel, the main thing though that you're paying for is the provider's time and experience. And I think it's really relevant to know how long someone has been doing that particular job. Because to be quite honest, of course you're gonna get a different result from someone who's been injecting at a high level for 15 years than you are from someone who's never picked up a syringe before. I used to do some training for dermal filler companies like Tioxane, Allergan. I don't do it so much anymore because I just don't have the time to do it. And let me tell you, there's a very, very broad spectrum of ability in people who come to those training classes. Some people have never picked up a syringe before and they don't know which end to hold it. If you wanna be injected by someone who's never even heard of hyaluronic acid, then go ahead. Um, obviously you're gonna get a great price for that. But the old adage is true, if you, buy cheap, often you'll pay twice. And if you don't get that, it means because often you'll have to then pay to correct it. One of the least smart things that people do when they're choosing their provider for their injectables or their surgery, or well, basically any healthcare in my opinion, is they will choose based on price rather than looking at who it is that's performing the injection or the procedure. This is not a smart move, in my opinion, because of course the level of skill of different providers is, is going to be different. So if you have two people performing, say, a blepharoplasty, one of which has been providing a blepharoplasty for many, many years, the other one has maybe just uh, qualified and taken their first surgical job, of course the one who's been performing it for longer is going to be better. There are of course other factors in there. So there really is no such thing as price matching when you're talking about cosmetic procedures like this. It's not like buying, I don't know, a camera on Amazon or Curry's, which is a website in the UK that sells electrical goods, and then you see which one is cheaper because it's not gonna be the same product you're basically paying for the experience. And when I say experience, I don't just mean how long have they been doing it for. I mean, if something goes wrong or if you're not happy with something, how likely is it that they're gonna be able to fix it for you and will fix it for you? Or are they just gonna disappear in the middle of the night? You're not necessarily safer either if you go to larger companies. After the PIP breast implant scandal a few years ago, there was a very famous chain of clinics over here in the UK. They had a lot of liability because they had many, many, many thousands of patients who had been operated on by surgeons who maybe weren't even resident in the UK. They knew it was gonna cost them a lot of money to replace all these different breast implants. So what they did was they closed their company and then the next day they reopened it under a different name with no liability. So there were an awful lot of women who were then not able to have their implants exchanged. You're better off going to an individual surgeon. Well, first of all, you know who they are, um, as opposed to just some random person that they shipped in for a day to operate and then 
buggers off again in the evening. But also, if they are present in the country, they're not going to want to sully their reputation by not helping you out later. And in fact, they probably wouldn't have used the PIP implants in the first place because they were a cheaper product. And in fact, that takes me on to a really important point. One of the factors behind pricing will of course be the choice of product that that particular provider is using. And there are wild differences between price points of dermal filler. This is an image that we've taken from Filler World, which is a website on which you can purchase various different brands of dermal filler. As you can see, they do have pricing on here, which is very competitive, let me tell you. I particularly like the look of this Rhino Fill, which I'm guessing people use for the lips. 29 pounds per mil, I think I'll stock up. Even better value is the Lumifil Max, coming in at £17.50. I'll have me some of that. You'll note that also on their website, they do have Juvederm and Sculptra and Filmed, which is not a bad company. I actually still wouldn't buy from a website like this. All our dermal fillers we obtain through pharmacies, so they come through the proper channels. These are normally grey imports, which is where they are sourced from abroad and then shipped into the country. This is an issue because the companies will not provide support for people who use products which are not through an approved reseller. So if you have a problem, you're in trouble. And second of all, there is an issue with counterfeit products. Last year, the US Customs seized $35,000 worth of counterfeit Botox in Cincinnati. Why is counterfeit Botox a problem? Well, because you don't know what's in it obviously. So first of all, it may not work. Second of all, you can have problems with dilution. So because Botox and other botulinum toxins, which are available via pharmacies, are classified as drugs, they go through a very, very robust process of measurement and certification. So you know that when you buy a vial of Botox, for example, which is 200 units, you know you're getting 200 units in there. But what if it's 300 units instead? What if it's 100 units instead? So you could end up with a subpar cosmetic result because your injector won't know exactly how many units it is that they're putting in. This lady had what she thought were Botox injections into the forehead. Let me tell you, Botox would never do this. And I don't know exactly what it was that she had injected, but it certainly left her with multiple different spots of infection on the face. There's obviously some kind of impurity in the mixture that was injected into this lady. You would never have that if you purchase your supplies directly through a pharmacy. Some people are curious as to why we might charge more than someone else performing these injections. My question to you would be, compared to what? Compared to what are we more expensive? Beauty blogger Anshal Seda investigated the cosmetic injectables industry and found that the woman who had injected the previous patient with the facial abscesses had undergone one day of training. Now we do have a huge problem over here in the UK with a wildly unregulated cosmetic injectables market. Recently, I saw a video from a hair and beauty academy which showed one of their delegates performing liposuction and advertising fat transfer. This is not a doctor or a nurse or a dentist. It's just a random. It was a hair and beauty academy. I presume a hairdresser, I don't know. I am definitely not slagging off hairdressers. My partner's a hairdresser. But he would never let me cut his hair, let me tell you. And I have asked if I can have a go. And he said no. For the bargain price of 200 pounds, you can now have fat transfer to the buttocks or the breast. Need I remind you that you can actually die from fat transfer to the buttocks? In fact, BBL was banned in the UK for that very reason, because of the significantly increased risk of death from intra-arterial injection of fat, causing pulmonary embolus of the fat, and then you can't breathe and you die. I've had a BBL twice. In the right hands, it's a very safe procedure. I would not be trusting 
a hairdresser, a beauty therapist, anyone who is not specifically surgically trained and surgically trained in that procedure to be doing a BBL for me. And if you do, you're probably stupid and poor, sorry. But there is a reason that things cost the price that they cost. And at the end of the day, these are discretionary luxury services that you're having. It's not a right. Mind you, even insulin isn't a right in the US, is it? You don't even have the right to live. So why should you have the right to have a cheap BBL? Also from the same article, we can see this lady here who had dermal filler injection into her nose and got a blood vessel occlusion. This is a recognized complication from having a dermal filler injection into the nose. It can happen. The issue, however, arises when it's not treated appropriately. So in this case, it's relatively easy to fix. You just inject some hyaluronidase into the area, break down the filler, the blood flow is restored. The patient doesn't come to any long-term harm as a result. If you don't do it, then this is what happens. The same thing can also cause blindness as well. And this is something that we've touched on in another video. Link is in the description. The other thing that I'd like to talk about is training. Also referenced in the same article is this particular training course, which is ran over here. And after five hours of online training, uh, one of the nurses actually is invited to the center to practice on a volunteer. This is a clip from the aforementioned article. As you can see, during the treatment, the trainer stops to answer her phone and a volunteer has a quick vape. The trainer qualified as a nurse 18 days before starting to teach this course. So plenty of experience. In addition to this, Thread lifts in the UK should be carried out in a CQC regulated facility. I have no idea if this place is CQC regulated, but I would highly doubt it. What about when people decide to go abroad to have surgery? Now, I have been abroad to have surgery myself. I went to Marbella in Spain twice to have my BBL surgery. That's purely because it's not available here. In the end, I went to a surgeon who does a ton of these. He's been doing them for 15 years. He does many, many cases, five or six a day. Would I have done it in the UK if I could? Yeah, I would have. These are just a few different articles that we pulled on patients who have suffered morbidity or mortality after having cosmetic surgery performed abroad. In this one, patient was operated on by a surgeon not certified to perform cosmetic surgery and had been arrested on charges of causing reckless death. Mark Henley, who is a consultant plastic surgeon and a member of the British Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgeons said, the problem is that you can assume nothing. In Britain, we have the NHS and a certain level of standards. In other countries, the systems are very different. Thailand is very variable. There are some real specialists, but then there is the fringe. In this article, a woman in Australia died after having a breast filler surgery allegedly carried out by a Chinese tourist. I don't think that she was just some random Chinese tourist. I understand that she did have a degree of training, uh, but according to the news article, it says that she was a university graduate and specialized in dermatology. Whatever that means, who knows? In any case, she wasn't regulated by any Australian medical legal system. So the issue is if something goes wrong, there's very little recourse for action. Mother of three dies following liposuction in Turkey. In this case, this lady died from peritonitis, most likely from a perforation during her liposuction procedure. Her husband found out about her death via a WhatsApp message. Honestly, that just shouldn't happen. The rules and regulations are different and if something goes wrong, you're not close by. According to this article in The Guardian, in the last six years, 12 patients from New York have died in the Dominican Republic as a result of plastic surgery. That seems like an awfully high number. This article claims that the Dominican Republic doesn't adhere to the same US regulations concerning how much body fat can be removed in one surgery, which increases the likelihood of heart failure and other consequences during procedures. This is actually a conversation I had with my surgeon uh, when I was having my uh, liposuction and BBL procedure. 
it's his method to take less and perhaps do the procedure more than once in order to get the desired result. But in the majority of cases, we add additional fat grafting that is less traumatic, works very well in the second rounds because the hips are widened already and that usually is, is, is the best possible solution. Also referenced in this article are two surgeons, Contreras and Cabral, excuse the accent, who have been in the papers a combined nine times after patients died during operations. But who says there's no such thing as bad press? Cabral, who has more than 270,000 Instagram followers, in 2011 pleaded guilty to charges from the New York Attorney General's office that he had treated patients in Upper Manhattan without a state medical license on at least 10 different occasions. What a naughty man. The Dominican Society of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery the local regulatory board that oversees the industry told a local news station that Cabral had been suspended from the association since 2015. He was still able to practice since he was registered with the country's health ministry, which illustrates the lax rules in the Dominican Republic. Even the <laughs> favourite doctor, Dr. <laughs> has also been a bit of a naughty man was placed on probation for five years by the Medical Board of California. That was back in 2009. Hopefully he's mended his ways. So just very briefly, he was ordered to go on an education course, clinical training program, medical record keeping course, ethics course, clinician patient communication course, had practice monitoring, was prohibited from solo practice, prohibited from supervising physician's assistants, had to provide notification of where he was practicing medicine and had to make quarterly declarations about all the above stuff. This is freely available information, it's all online. But what about our team? Have we just been practicing for five minutes? Definitely not. If you look at three of our four doctors, we have degrees in both medicine and dentistry and we've been doing aesthetics for a really, really long time. Actually, I started back in 2007 and I wasn't full time at that point. In fact, it took me a while to get to the point where I was working in aesthetics full time, which brings me to my next point. Do you think I was as good at doing aesthetic work in 2007 as I am in 2021? Answers on a postcard, please. Do you think that having it as my full time and only job would give me more clinical experience which is relevant to patient results. Is someone who is practicing in this field as a side gig, part time, maybe once or twice a month, gonna have the same caseload? Are they gonna have the time that they can devote to spend learning more, going to conferences, performing other professional development activities, looking at different fillers for example, different machines, devices, are they going to have the time to spend with you for your aftercare if you need help? Are they going to have the knowledge to be able to do a full face consultation for you? Or is it like the old analogy, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Now, I'm not saying that just because somebody has been practicing a very long time, it automatically makes them an excellent injector. I'm not saying that just because someone's on the specialist register, it automatically makes them an excellent injector. It doesn't but you have to use your loaf, as my dad would have said. And you have to make your own judgment call about whether or not you think they have sufficient experience. Would you go to a cardiac surgeon to have a hip replacement? They're both surgeons, why wouldn't you? It's the same thing, right? Would you go to a gynecologist to sort out your Parkinson's disease? Probably not, but why not? It's the same thing, right? It's still the body. Would you go to a dermatologist to do your Botox? That's actually a really interesting question. And I think the answer is different in different countries. For example, in the States, most of the dermatologists will have extensive training with lasers. However, here it's not really something that comes up so much. They'll spend all their time treating eczema, psoriasis. Most exciting thing that maybe they'll see is lichen planus. And their favorite drug is gonna be a steroid. They don't really do Botox. It's the same thing with plastic surgery, actually. If I was gonna have a rhinoplasty, for example, I'd want to go to an ENT surgeon 
who just did rhinoplasty, I wouldn't want to go and see a general plastic surgeon. Because over here they spend a lot of their time doing crush injuries and burns. Not even boobs and ass, actually. Crush injuries and burns. What's the point? It sounds good, but is it? And of course you want to know what their vibe is. Different injectors will have a different style. It's important to know what you want. For example, for a lot of patients that come in through our doors, they want to look really, 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 really natural, like they haven't had anything done. Perhaps in a different clinic or in a different part of the country, people are after maybe a slightly more augmented look and they want something that looks a little more obvious, should we say. But I would be out of business pretty quickly if I transplanted their results to my clinic. So yeah, I guess what I'm saying probably sounds a bit self-serving, but it's actually true. Having a high case number has changed my practice. I'm not the same injector that I was back in 2007. Having a team of other very experienced injectors has also changed my practice as well, because if something crops up that the other one hasn't seen, one of us will have seen it. And that is what you're paying for. So look, you have to weigh up what's important for you. You might be interested to know that for a mil, we charge 595. For each subsequent mil, it's 400 pounds. So it's not the most expensive in the area, but it's not the cheapest either. Although if you don't mind me saying so, I think it's fantastic value. Let us know in the comments section below if you've ever paid a ridiculously cheap amount for filler or if you've paid an awful lot and whether or not you thought it was worth it. See you next week, maybe. Depends if we make a video or not, but I will try.